I'm beginning to finally feel okay. I met someone named Jesus just well, just the other day. Good morning, everyone. Great to be together here in the Lord's house and welcome to those in the sanctuary and those in the courtyard and those that will be watching this later at home. It's great to be together and worship our Lord God. Would you please stand with me as we open our service. Behold, bless the Lord, all servants of the Lord who serve by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands to the sanctuary and bless the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion, he who has made heaven and earth. Father God, we have so much to be thankful for today, for your love and for your mercy, for your compassion. That's, that's just, it's mind boggling, Lord. Your grace and, oh, Father God, the way that, that you have through your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, redeemed us from sin and death and have given us the greatest hope. Why, Father, we're the light of the world, and oh, that that light would shine, that we would be that city set upon a hill because of what the Lord Jesus has done for us. And so, Lord, we're delighted to be here to worship you, to lift up this sacrifice of praise, and that every part of the service, Lord, would bring you the greatest glory. And we pray together as God's people, our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. and mercy we do thank you Lord for the gift of salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ and we're thankful Lord that we can come together as the people of God to lift up our prayers and petitions the Lord we also confess our sins and confess the sins of our nation Lord especially at this time this very vulnerable moment in America's history and Lord we bring our nation before you our president and leaders and Lord, we pray for the Supreme Court nomination 
Uh, we're thankful, Lord, for the person who's been presented, uh, that she apparently will follow the Constitution, and, and Lord God, that you would just bless and watch over that whole process. We just leave that bef before you today, Lord. Father, we thank you as a church that we can be gathered here and all throughout the winter months and celebrating the name of Jesus and being a witness for you in these services, Lord, in the Bible studies. I thank you for those who gathered, Lord, not here just on Sundays, but throughout the week. I thank, Lord, of the many ministries that go on here and for those to provide for them. Pray for Harley, who's living a little bit under the weather, and pray for him as he leads the men's ministry. Lord, remember Meg and Paul's parents before you. Lord, for their health needs, and Lord, as Meg and Paul, just give them wisdom as they care for them. Father, God, watch over. And Father, we also thank you that there's been a good report for this little boy, Zeke, and we pray, Lord, as he continues his medicines, Father, God, for healing as we've been praying for little Sid as well, Father. We do pray for Lighthouse Christian Academy, for their needs, for their staff, particularly for teachers, Lord, and uh, Father, we look to you for that answer that someone would sense that calling in their life and and step forward to to meet that particular need father we thank you for the witness and the work of the ministries around us think of harvey cedar's bible conference pray lord too for pastor luke down south of us here lord on the island bless his ministry today father also bless his family as his own father had passed away recently Lord, we pray for those who have been going down to Atlantic City Rescue Mission. Think too of also, Lord, of America's Keswick. Pray for Bill Welty again, Lord, today. And pray too through this month for Debbie Krugel, Lord. And thank you for her faithful work in Malawi and how well Debbie's been doing. Continue to bless her. And we remember Casey and Valerie and the boys. And pray too for the Harris family as they've been transitioning to the U.S. Thank you. They've been doing so well and the kids are enjoying school and Ellie, her job. And and Brad, as he adjusts as well, Lord God, and for all these things. Pray too, Lord, for Nancy's sister, Susan, and continue to pray also for her husband. Remember Veronica and their family. Pray for this, also a cousin of Meg's, Amy. Lord God, bring her before you. Pray, Lord, for Dave's father as well, who asked for salvation. His dad was eyes would, and his heart would open to the Lord. Pray too for Jerry. And remember, Lord, our own secretary, Lydia, pray for Bob, Father, for that provision of a kidney for him. Remember Dave Wick's need, and also for this lady, Christine, Father God, who has colon cancer. Lord, we just thank you for how you continue to provide through your people, through this church. And Lord, how we continue just to march forward. And Lord, again, we submit the upcoming elections before you. Uh, Lord, each of us here have our own heart's desire. And Lord God, we especially pray it would be someone who would humble himself before Almighty God, who truly would be a servant of the nation. And Lord, so we just commit all these things to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And amen. But I just, again, I appreciate all of you. I appreciate the love for the Lord Jesus and the love for the Word of God that I see here in our church congregation. Numbers chapter 18, verse 1 this is what it says. So Yahweh said to Aaron, you and your sons and your father's household with you shall bear the guilt in connection with the sanctuary and you and your sons with you shall bear the guilt in connection with your priesthood. Now, let me just tell you that what our Lord God has just declared to Aaron is profoundly much deeper than anything you can handle in a 10-minute devotional message. And I mean no offense by that, but what happens here in this particular verse is so significant in terms of Bible doctrine or Bible teaching that that's why we have to pause because actually what happens here in verse 1, what God has now declared ultimately points to our high priest, our great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's really what we're going to be looking at because part of the question that we could ask is, how is it 
that one man, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but how is it that one man could be the sin mediator of the sins of the world? The key word is a nugget of gold. And maybe you've heard sermons around this word. It's the word imputed. And that's actually the title of today's message, Imputed to One Man. Now, I know that doesn't sound flashy and not necessarily, oh, I don't want to say not interesting because it will be, I think, as we dig into this, especially as it leads us to the Lord Jesus. But this word imputed, biblically speaking, is used in two different contexts. It's used with reference to sin, sin laid upon. And also, it refers to righteousness. We might, as we know in the New Testament, Christ's righteousness is imputed to our account, is laid upon us. Well, Father God, we have some ground to cover here today. And there is teaching within this, Lord, but ultimately, there is practical application too. And there's a lot that takes place in this little verse. And I just pray, Lord God, that we'll go about it in such a way that no one will go away feeling confused, but actually amazed at how the word of God unfolds in its teaching. And so, Lord, again, for thy anointing and, and guidance and direction of the Holy Spirit, we look to you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Now, one thing is for certain, I don't want ever the Old Testament scriptures to feel like it's foreign and distant to our congregation because actually, as you know, in the New Testament, it says about the Hebrew scriptures that all scripture is what? Inspired by God and then is therefore very profitable for teaching and particularly for training in righteousness that we might be well-equipped people. So let me just for a moment refresh our thinking. Now I bet you all the things I'm going to say here are Linda over here. She probably has them all memorized. But one of the things I was thinking about is, do you remember Jacob? Jacob, who was Abraham's grandson, and Jacob was renamed Israel. And Jacob had had 12 sons by four wives. Now I could ask her and now name all the, the, the tribes. And, and I... And I, I wouldn't be surprised for someone who has all the hymns memorized in, in our church sanctuary. She probably, you know, she's being humble right now. But you might remember Reuben and Simeon and Levi, Judah, Zebulon, Issachar, Dan, Gad, and Asher, Naphtali, Joseph, and Benjamin. Now that's quite a crew, isn't it? To have 12 sons. That's a soccer team plus an extra player as well. Now, you might also remember that over time, the tribe of Levi was told that they wouldn't inherit any of the land, but that their tribe would be dispersed among the other tribes that would inherit the land. And so if you take one away from 12, and keep the math as simple as possible, that leaves us with what? 11. Cool. I'm glad you passed that test. Um, it leaves us with 11. So you subtract that out from the 12, you're left with 11 tribes. But how is it then that there are actually 12 tribes that inherit the land still? Because we've already taken away one. Well, actually, we can subtract out another name, the name of Joseph, because there's no tribe uh, that's mentioned owning land by the name of Joseph. So now we have uh, two taken away from 12, and that's how much? 10. Okay, so this is very good. I want to go shopping with you people. And so we're left with 10. So what happens? Well, actually, Joseph's two boys, Ephraim and Manasseh, become inheritors of the land. It's, it's as if to say, that Joseph receives a twofold blessing. And so if we add the two, Ephraim and Manasseh, back into the 10, how many do we end up with? Well, obviously, I hope you know that we end up with 12. And so that kind of explains that 
little thing. And, you know, it's funny. Things go through your mind when you're studying the Word of God. And so I just thought to myself, I'm just going to throw this in just at the start, just to sort of get our brains to start working here on this early morning. Well, now, the tribe of Levi was also divided into two divisions. You might not be aware of this, but let me flesh this out. Levi, you don't have to write this down, but if you can at least follow along with your mind, this is fine. Levi had three sons. Now, I like the first two because I can pronounce their names. It's the third one I have to work on a little bit. He had a son by the name of Gershon. He had another son by the name of Kohath. And then he had this other son by the name of Merari. Now, uh, that's a little bit different, but I, you might have heard a Jewish person by the name of Ari, uh, Ari Flesher or whatever, but this guy's name was Merari. And these names are mentioned in Exodus chapter 3, verse 16. Now, what's this about? Why am I mentioning the names of these three boys? Well, back in Numbers 17 and 18, we discover that the tabernacle, now remember at this time, the tabernacle was, was what? It was really a portable tent. It was something they could pack up. Because remember, they're living out in the desert. And they're going to wander in the desert for now 40 years. And so that tabernacle's got to be able to move. And exactly, it was designed that way. And so the tabernacle and the sacrificial duties of, of the priesthood, there was also, as you know, a high priest that was over all of them. That priesthood, that responsibility that we're learning about and we'll see today, is it was given to one particular son who was a descendant of only Kohath. And Kohath had a son named Amran, and then Amran, and subsequently these two individuals, Kohath was the grandfather of Aaron, and Amran was the father of Aaron. Now, did you follow what I just said? Levi had three sons. But one particular son, and through his lineage, leading to Aaron, they were specifically given the responsibility of the tabernacle and the sacrifices. And henceforth, they became known as the Aaronic priesthood. That's the word Aaron, just throw I-C on the end of it, you get the Aaronic priesthood. So you're following the Aaronic priesthood descended through Kohath and Amram were given the responsibility of the tabernacle and the sacrifices. Now that was only one part of the tribe of Levi because obviously there were two other sons, Gershon and Merari, and they were also relatives and obviously descendants of Levi, but they weren't responsible for the tabernacle or the sacrifices. Instead, they kind of became assistants to the Aaronic priesthood. They didn't, they didn't work in the tabernacle. They weren't responsible for the tabernacle, but the rest of the tribe of Levi had the responsibility of helping out those that were descended through Aaron uh, who had responsibility for the tabernacle. Now something I want to throw in here, because as you remember, Aaron was the older brother of Moses. It turns out that if you look these things up, which I already did for us, that actually Moses and Aaron's parents were both related not only to Kohath, but also to the same father, Amram. And that's not without significance. It is to say that Jacob, who was Abraham's grandson, Isaac's son, was Moses and Aaron's great-great-grandfather, but there's actually more. You remember the story we just saw recently of Korah and Korah's rebellion? Well, I, I was scratching my head just before I got to the rest of this message, 
And I was thinking about, I wonder, because remember, Korah was leading an insurrection against Moses and Aaron. And I thought to myself, I wonder how this old fellow Korah fits into the picture. Guess what? Korah himself was also a descendant of Kohath, but his father was a fellow by the name of Itzhar. In other words, as it turns out, Korah, and you might even want to write this down your Bible sometime if you go back and reread the story of Korah's rebellion. As it turns out, Korah was actually a cousin of Moses and Aaron. How about that? So rather than being, as they say in the old days, kissing cousins, now we know what that was about. They weren't kissing cousins. They were, they were actually two warring cousins. And so if you're a visual person, let me throw this all together for us. You have the 12 tribes of Israel. Now this is like a dartboard, which has the circles that go inside. So in the outer circle, you have the nation of Israel. And the nation of Israel is represented by the 12 tribes. But then you go into the next circle, going into the dartboard, and you have this special tribe of Levi that has been set apart by God, which is dispersed in terms of where they live among the 12 tribes. But then we discover that there's one more circle on the inside that from the tribe of Levi, there are also those individuals who are descendants of Aaron who then gain the responsibility for the tabernacle and the sacrifices. Now, all of these things I've just said, you might think to yourself, what on earth, where is he going with this? Trust me, uh, there's a method to my madness here for why it's so important. And one of the things is simply this. When we think about Jesus being our high priest, there's an issue that comes up. Guess what? Jesus is not in the lineage of Aaron. Jesus is not even a, a Levite. Jesus actually was born in the lineage, do you remember which tribe? The tribe of Judah. And so this actually does raise a real issue, an issue that Jewish people who don't, even, who don't believe in Jesus the Messiah may even raise this as an objection. They might say to us, do you know that your Yeshua, your Jesus, belongs to the tribe of Judah? So how could he ever be our high priest if he doesn't belong to the lineage of Aaron in the tribe of Levi? Well, we're going to answer that before we conclude today. But first, in verse 1 of chapter 18, a very grave burden is laid upon, imputed, to the Aaronic priesthood. This is significant. Let me read it again, but this time from the King James translation. The King James reads this way, And the Lord, or Yahweh, said unto Aaron, Thou and thy sons and thy father's house with thee shall bear the iniquity of the sanctuary, and thou and thy sons with thee shall bear the iniquity of your priesthood. Now here's the thing, and I was talking with my wife about this this last week. I said, do you remember a message ever in Numbers chapter 18, verse one, kind of now? Do you rem and then I was telling her about what I saw in this particular verse, and I, and I, I do you remember ever hearing this taught? And she said, no. And I said, well, you know, my memory's not the best, but to be honest, I, I can't remember ever having been taught this, even in Bible college or seminary, and yet here it, here it is. As we know, from the fall of Adam, sin could be atoned for. Sin could be covered over. How? By someone offering a sacrifice. Now, think about this. In the very beginning, when Adam and Eve sinned, we immediately see that the first person who actually engages in sacrifice by inference is none other than the Lord God himself. Why do I say that? Because he clothes Adam and Eve in what? 
in animal skins. So obviously there is already that picture. I don't know if you realize that, but our clothing is actually uh, an old ancient symbol of the need for the covering over of sin. But of course, animal skins would have implied that animals or an animal or probably one or two or at least had to be sacrificed in order for the Lord God to cover them over. As you also probably remember, that was a major issue with Cain and Abel because Cain brought from the fruit of the ground, but his brother brought what? He brought an animal sacrifice, which the scriptures say was even more pleasing to the Lord God. Now, I mention this for a reason, because in the early ancient days, sacrifice for sin was made by the individual coming before the Lord God. In other words, if you and I had lived in the time of Adam or Noah or even in Abraham's day, and if you and I had sinned, we would have gone, found our own animal sacrifice, and we would have brought that before the Lord ourselves. But as you know, over time, things began to change. And God calls out a nation unto himself, the nation of Israel. And to the nation of Israel, he begins to give laws and regulations about sacrifice, doesn't he? And so all of a sudden, Israel is now told, you have a whole system of sacrifice. And so what happens? The tabernacle gets built, the altar of sacrifice is built, and so you have this priesthood from the Levites. But if you remember, at this point in time, the people are still coming to the doorway of the tabernacle, bringing their sacrifices to the priests. And then therefore the priest would take their animal, the priest would slaughter the animal, and then lift up that animal in sacrifice upon the altar of sacrifice. You follow, right? This is, I don't think this is too hard to understand at this point. But in Numbers chapter 18, verse 1, there is a very significant shift which actually sets the stage, and this is why I get excited, because it actually sets the stage for the Lord Jesus Christ. Because remember, up until this time, in Adam, Noah, and Abraham's day, people could sacrifice for themselves. Then under the nation of Israel, the people could still bring their animal sacrifice, and the priest would offer it up on the altar of sacrifice for that person who had brought that sacrifice. So if I had sinned, I could go, and I wasn't a Levite, I could go to the doorway of the tent meeting and say, hey, Aaron, good to see you. I didn't know you were working today. Aaron, here's my animal sacrifice. I sinned, and this is what I did, and please bring this sacrifice before the Lord for me, and that would have been done. But now, in Numbers chapter 18, what did we read? We read that now, what has happened? Looking again, it says, The Lord said to Aaron, Thou and thy sons and thy father's house with thee shall now what? Shall bear the iniquity of the sanctuary. And then notice this, And shall bear the iniquity of your priesthood. I don't know if you catch what that actually means. But now God is saying to the priest, You know how previously... You were working on behalf of this other person who brought their sacrifice to the doorway of the tabernacle? Yes, Lord. Well, guess what? For one thing, the people of Israel from this point forward in the wilderness aren't even going to be allowed to come close to the doorway of the tabernacle. Actually, it's going to be the assistance from the tribe of Levi who are going to bring these sacrifices. So in other words, if I'm in the tribe of Manasseh, I go look for my local Levite 
and I say, can you take this for me up to wherever the tabernacle is? Sure, because that's my job. So the Levite would have brought the sacrifice, the animal, to the doorway of the tabernacle, but not allowed to go inside because there he would have been met by a priest. But guess what? Now, at this point in time, now the sin itself was now being laid upon the priest who met them at the door. I don't know about you, but how would you have liked to have been told this if you were a priest in that day? Because now you're being told that whatever sins people have committed and whatever sacrifices they send in your direction, when that animal is presented to you at the doorway of the tabernacle, that person's sin is now imputed to your account. And so now the priest who is given this animal is being told that he no longer is doing it for the other person, but he's doing what? He's doing it for himself. Because now, let's just say, for example, I belong to the tribe of Manasseh and I stole something. I feel bad about it. I want to make restitution for it. I know how to do that. And part of it is sending an animal to the tabernacle to get sacrifice. And so I go and I grab my local Levite representative and I say, here's my ox take it up to the tabernacle and tell those guys that I stole something and I need to be forgiven. And so that Levite representative takes it up to the doorway of the tabernacle and the priest meets him there and he takes the ox and from that point forward, the priest is now guilty of stealing. It has now been laid upon him. It's interesting to think about this whole idea of imputation because now what happens? This priest must make restitution for himself. It's just as if to say that if you understand this part, you'll understand the whole picture. When Adam sinned, because theologically you and I were, so to speak, in the loins of Adam, because Adam was our first representative. The Bible says in Romans 5, 19, for as through one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. Adam represented the human race. Actually, it was not when Eve sinned, but it was when Adam sinned that thereafter the race would fall. Adam was our representative wasn't it but unfortunately and unfortunately so because Adam was our representative what happened the Bible says for as in Adam all die why do we all die why are you and I all born into sin because Adam is our representative so too, the Bible says in Romans 5, 19, but even so through the obedience of one, the many will be made righteous. You remember at the beginning of my message, I asked the question, how is it actually that one man, Jesus Christ, could die for so many? How is that possible? When we begin to realize what has happened in Numbers 18, it begins to become clear because now the sin, and in Christ's case, the sins of the world have been laid upon him. Do you know in the Bible, and I don't know if you want to look this up, but it's a beautiful passage in Hebrews chapter 9. It's just two verses, 11 and 12 but it puts these whole things together. It says there in Hebrews 9, 11, and 12, 
But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. I don't know if you've ever been taught this, but the tabernacle on the earth was actually a carbon copy of apparently the tabernacle in heaven. And this passage is telling us that when Jesus died, that he presented himself not just through an earthly tabernacle when the veil was ripped from top to bottom, but also in that heavenly tabernacle, he gained access, what now? Not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. Now, think about this. Here is Jesus Christ. He's actually quite different from the Aaronic priesthood because the Aaronic priesthood are given animals. And if I'm a priest at that time, and now the sin, your sin, somebody else's sin, the sin of stealing, as I was illustrating, is laid upon me, what do I do? I take that animal and I sacrifice that animal to pay for that sin of stealing. And of course, at that point in time, it's atoned for, it's covered over, but not perfectly so. Now think about Jesus Christ. Picture it this way. Jesus is standing at the doorway of the tabernacle. And now we're all coming to him, especially those who would believe. And we're coming to him with all of our sins. That's a boatload. And then we're saying to Jesus, we want you to take our sins upon you. After all, you're our high priest. And his father has said to him, this is what you're going to do. You're going to take the sins upon yourself. Now, Christ being our high priest, looking at this, what would he conclude? That animal sacrifices are now no longer sufficient. Why? Well, for one thing, animals aren't humans. Adam was our first representative. But the Bible also says, for as an Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. In other words, anyone who has a relationship with Jesus is forgiven. And so Jesus, who's standing at the doorway of the tabernacle with all of these sinners in front of him, there is, like you might remember Isaac, classic passage, says to his father Abraham up on the mountain, Daddy, where's the lamb? Where's the sacrifice? And as we know, Abraham had been instructed to take Isaac. Here is the Lord Jesus at the doorway of the tabernacle with all these sins being now laid upon him. Numbers 18 verse 1, because for henceforth no longer would people sacrifice for themselves. No longer would people just walk up to the doorway of the tent and offer an animal for their sins. But now they had to remain at a great distance. Why, they even had to use a Levite to get the animal sacrifice to the doorway of the tent. And now here we are standing at the doorway of the tent as sinners and Christ is before us. And there was only one thing that he could offer that was perfect. And that was what? Himself himself do you see how numbers 18 brings us to christ as our high priest that as it has shifted over time 
it has now in Numbers 18 verse 1 made it possible that now one man could bear the sins of many. Of course, as you know, though, there's another issue. Jesus wasn't a member of the tribe of Levi. He was of the tribe of Judah. So then how could he even be a high priest? And if you think about it, remember the descendants of Aaron at the time of Jesus? You know, those fellows Caiaphas and Annas, they were the high priests at the time of Jesus' trial. How would you have characterized Caiaphas and Annas? How about as two wicked, corrupted, sinful men? They were the worst can The ironic tribe by the time of Jesus uh, was as bad as it could. It, it would have made it worse, actually, if Jesus had been born into the tribe of Levi, as well as create another issue because the king would have to come from the tribe of Judah. It is to say, why was Jesus, though, not a part of the tribe of Levi? Not only because he needed to be a king from the tribe of Judah, but who on earth would want him to be part of a tribe that had become corrupt and by the time of Christ's life was nothing more than a sham? Because after all, that's what his trial was. And so how does God do this? This is why this fellow Melchizedek comes into the story. And we always think to ourselves, who on earth is Melchizedek? He's this ancient guy who Abraham meets. We don't know anything really about this guy's background except one key factor, that Melchizedek was appointed a priest by God. That he was not appointed uh, because of his lineage or who he was related to but that Melchizedek was appointed by God. How did Jesus Christ become the high priest? Not because of lineage, not because of seed, but because his father appointed him the high priest. And I would dare say, wouldn't that be far better? Wouldn't it be far better to be able to say that Christ our high priest has been appointed by his father and he stands ready. Listen to this in Hebrews 7 verses 23 through 28. The former priests on the one hand, they existed in greater numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing. I don't know if you just caught this, but what they're saying is, you know why there were so many priests in Israel? Because they were always dying. He always had to have people to replace them. After all, there was a lot of sacrificing that went on. But he, referring to Christ on the other hand, because he abides forever, he holds this priesthood permanently. That's one way Jesus is different. He is our high priest forever. Hence also he's able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was fitting that we should have such a high priest why? Because he's holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners. Is that not true of Christ? And exalted above the heavens, who doesn't need daily like those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people because he did this once for all when he offered up himself. Oh, there's that verse in scriptures that say about our Lord Jesus, he who knew no sin became sin. How? Because our sins were imputed, laid upon Jesus Christ. And the law appoints men as high priests, but they're weak. But the word of oath which came after the law appoints a son made perfect forever. Really, in the final analysis, what does this all mean? And I'll admit to you that much of this message today has been a teaching sermon. But what it really means is, is that because Christ was not from the tribe of Levi, because he was not related to Aaron, that Jesus Christ's priesthood is actually superior, lasting, and eternal. Think about this. When those people showed up, when the Levites showed up with the animal and said, hey, uh, 
Harry over there in the tribe of Manasseh stole something and he sent me to send to bring this animal to you so you guys could sacrifice it but now the sins laid upon you what do you have you have a sinner priest going before God but in Jesus Christ we have the perfect man the perfect God man who now as guiltless as he should be has allowed our sin to be laid upon him and because of numbers chapter 18 verse 1 it makes it all possible that now by one man righteousness could also be imputed to our account it is to say that when Jesus turns to his father he doesn't turn to his father with an animal in his arms but he turns to his father and comes to his father's tabernacle in heaven on the basis of his own blood do you now understand why it says in the Gospels that Christ came to seek and save the lost and he came to give his life a what as a ransom as a payment for many and guess what folks guess what beloved that's us right here this morning if we know the Lord Jesus as our Savior that's the assurance that we have that our Savior by his precious blood allowed our sins to be laid upon him and by his blood are we cleansed before Almighty God would you stand with me and so Lord Jesus what is the application of today's message well first if we don't know you we need to we need to repent and to flee to you and to your feet and believe in you and believe that you were the perfect sacrifice that died for our sins but what about for the rest of us here this morning who already know you Lord and have a relationship what what is the practical application for us well how about this how about praise how about thanksgiving how about leaving the sanctuary and this courtyard of praise today going out from this place and thinking on the drive home wow Jesus did this all for me he stood in my place oh I now I really get it now I really uh, thank you Lord thank you father that I have such assurance now Lord I pray that you'll bless each and every person and every family represented here today in the name of Jesus amen, amen. and amen folks God bless your day I think I'm beginning Finally feel okay I met someone named Jesus just Well, just the other day